This program is brought to you by Guiding Light Assembly. To make birds, he used his imagination to make dogs, he used his imagination to make cats, he used his imagination to make flowers, he used his imagination to make the sun, he used his imagination to make the land, the grass, the earth. But when he was making you, he did not imagine anything. He looked within himself. The Bible says that he said, let us make man in our own image. And so he looked at himself and he said, what are the qualities of myself that I want to exemplify? And then he took of those identities of his own self, wrapped them up and made you. And so whenever you feel like you're your mistakes, you need to realize or recognize that you are not the mistakes that you made. You are not who you were. You are not who you even feel like you are today. You are who God says you are. And so when God approached Gideon and the angel came to him and said, you mighty man of valor, Gideon could never see himself as a mighty man of valor, but there was a mighty man of valor standing right there. He just didn't realize it was him, but that was always his identity. And so while this sounds like something interesting and good to hear, God is really kind of speaking to me about this fact. It is one thing to know that I am through revelation or wisdom, or for somebody to tell me I'm who God said that I am, or to even recount what it is God said about me. But then how do I begin to become that person when I do not feel like that person? How do I become who I truly am in Christ when I still feel weak, I still feel worthless, I still feel like a liar, I still feel like a cheat, I still feel completely and utterly unworthy, I still feel incapable of achieving that great feat, I still feel like if you matched me and stood me next to God, there would be no comparison. While that remains eternally true in the physical, the Bible says that he has made you a joint heir with Christ, which means all things Christ has, you have. But I just don't feel it. I started to think, what is it that we've got to do to take on that person? What is it that we've got to do to fully walk and live in the identity that I have been given by God? And it's a really, really hard thing to do here in the earth. I use this example of kings. A king... sovereign over land and has authority over that land which they have, they're, they're king over. So I'll use King Charles, king Charles for example simply because because well, I'm using King Charles I'm going to complicate matters for me. <laughs> Alright, so King Charles is king of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and yeah, some other domains that they have there. Right. So King Charles is the king of that land, and that is important, and that is true, right? Yes. And he has authority over that land, and he remains sovereign over that land. But King Charles does not own every plot of land in that country. And so in England, for example, they have what they call lords, and the idea behind lords were people who owned land. It's where the idea of landlord comes from when you rent property. It's the lord over that land. Now, the lord does not have as much authority as the king. But the lord is in control of the territory with which he owns. Now, the king might be sovereign over the entire land, but if the king wants to do something with land that is owned by the Lord, he must still go to him. And that's kind of how the human body works. We have a spirit, and you are spirit. But unfortunately, while we're here in the earth, the spirit only has one-third domain over your body. Because there are three parts to every human being there is your spirit which is who you are which is what your identity is and then there is your soul and your soul 
is made up of different things. The soul is made up of your mind. Your soul is made up of your will. Your soul is made up of your emotions. Now you are not your soul. You are not your soul. You are your spirit. But you have a soul. And your soul lives in a body. Okay. Now, the hardest part of it, I always use the, the notion of dating. Now, we always say that a guy should approach somebody and they should be looking at the babe not just for their physical capacities. They should be looking at them for their character. They should decide, they should build that relationship based on character and emotions and and um, and their and their value system these are all well and these are all good but unfortunately as human beings as long as we're in human flesh you do not look at somebody and see their character you do not look at somebody and see their spiritual values you look at them and you see their body it is meant to be in the lowest point of which we reference when we are deciding how we value someone in our lives. But it's the first point of contact that we have with that person. And so no matter what we try and do, our decision at first will be based on the physical. Your physical chooses whether you approach the person, if you are attracted to the person physically. And so how do I value the thing highest that it takes me the longest to see. I approached you. Now I want to make you think that I didn't just approach you because of how you looked. Because you, if I just come and say, you're fine. Like what is that doing for you? Because you want substance. And I think it's really interesting as to how God created human beings, right? People often say that women, they desire to see intellect when they speak to someone. They want to see that you have values. They want to see how you think. They want to understand those things. And so even though we approach you for your attraction, because you are looking for more, we too must present more. So I want to get to know you on a spiritual level. But I cannot glance at you from a spiritual level. I can only glance at you in the physical. How do I then search deeper? We have one conversation. You think things that... I know she thought things I said were very interesting. She might deny them now, but look, we're married, so it means that she did. And so... Why are you looking at me like that? You're rude. <laughs> but the first encounter might be physical. But there always has to be more within. And that's kind of how our spirit works. We look in the mirror and we see ourselves physically. You might see something, you look in the mirror, you feel like that's just not it. You don't always feel beautiful when you look at yourself in the mirror. You don't always feel fresh. And so you've got to work past your physical abilities or inabilities. Like the Spirit of God might tell me to climb a mountain. And he has enabled me and equipped me to climb that mountain. But unfortunately, the condition of my body will not permit me to climb that mountain. So your identity in Christ is equipped and enabled to do all things through Christ. But you are limited by your physical condition. Therefore, in order to be the best version of yourself in the earth, you have to learn to align your physical body with your spiritual condition. 
that is the first barrier we face as human beings is our physical condition what does your body permit you to do in alignment with the spirit of god what does your body what is your body conditioned to do how well did you take care of your body how well i know i'm sounding hypocritical because you i eat a lot of junk but (laughs) we're all a work in progress in jesus name (laughs) your physical body has to go under a process of renewal this is the hardest thing of understanding who we are in Christ because the Bible says that when he saved us he is able to save to the uttermost that means he saved you completely that means that the moment you said you believe in Jesus Christ and it was true in your heart your spirit became fully saved but that your spirit is fully saved does not mean your physical body And it's very hard to believe your spirit when your body is telling you the opposite. But we have to learn that one, the body can be the body can be honest but not truthful. And so we have to learn to break down and to begin to go through a journey to improve our physical condition to align with our spiritual one and then the harder one if not is your soul your soul is such a hard place to overcome it is a territory that your spirit has to learn to overcome to occupy to take control over we think that knowledge the Bible says that, see how we actually quote things and we say things are Bible and they're not the Bible not the Bible men say knowledge is king and when you live under that mindset or that conception you become a slave to your soul because you become a slave to your mind you think that what you have intellectually is what defines the range or the distance that you can go knowledge is good but knowledge has to come under the lens of the spirit and so your mind tells you something your mind if anyone has ever done a 21 day fast you're strong, you're excited, your mind believes that you can do it on day one. There will be a time even in day one where your mind tells you, this is foolishness. You will starve me and I will die. I will give out on you. And you have to overcome your mind in order for your spirit to be adequately fed because the moment you lose the battle in your mind and become subject to the influence on your mind of your body telling you that there is a hunger that needs to be that needs to be dealt with in this moment then you stop and you miss the opportunity to feed your spirit and you feed your flesh instead One of the hardest places to overcome the soul before I go there, I'll complete on the mind. So I was saying non by we say that knowledge is king. It's important, knowledge is good. And even the Bible will tell us to get knowledge. But you'll realize the Bible is very intentional that knowledge cannot be the only basis by which you live knowledge has to be turned into a place of understanding where you know what that information means so many people are informed but they do not understand the things they know i always use the example of it's really bad i always use the example of 
the only thing my mom always used to say is no knowledge is better than half knowledge because the thing about people that think they know is when you get half knowledge you think you know in full and you act based on half knowledge and you never try and get the rest of the information or the knowledge why they say in the land of the blind the one eyed man is king but his vision is half in fact his vision is 25% even the man that has full vision cannot see behind him And so knowledge has to turn into understanding. And then the Bible often references for us the people of Issachar because they didn't simply have understanding of their knowledge. They had wisdom of how to act upon that knowledge. And where did that come from? It was not simply intellectual, it was spiritual. And so your spirit has to learn the, the way that we're meant to go. So I was using the, the, direct, the definition or the example of men and women when, we, when you begin to date or when people are speaking. is because we go from body so to spirit when the direction things ought to work are spirit so to body so we can't let our spirit be influenced by our body because our body is being inf- is influencing our soul we've got to let our spirit influence our soul which influences our body bible says of the mind that be you renewed your mind um sorry right be you transformed in your be be transformed by the renewing of your mind why because your spirits become saved eternally fully completely the moment you believe in god but your mind is on a journey of renewal and your mind has to be continually influenced by your spirit after that then there's the battle of the will the bible says in first peter no, in 2 Peter 1, that no prophecy, knowing this, that no prophecy came by the wisdom of men, but that they were always led by the Holy Spirit. The biggest thing that gets in the way of the Spirit of God moving in your life and in our lives is personal will. I don't know how many times we've done this in our lives. I can think of a thousand for myself. Where you want something, and everything because you are so blinded by that will you have turned the scripture to align with that will you have found ways to mean that God must desire this thing for me because the will is an ugly filter if it has not first driven through the place of the spirit of God and so you desire things and you will things and you know who you are in Christ in parts but then you you, your will wants something and it's hard to believe you're who you really are because you have not driven your will through the lens of the Spirit of God. It's a weird filter because if you pour water through one end, you'll get one result. If you pour water through the other end, you'll get a totally different result. But it's so much easier sometimes to pour water through the lens of the body and let it flow the other way. And and cause your spirit to become impure. Because know this, you have a spirit that is separate from the spirit of God. The spirit of God influences you through your spirit and that will influence your soul and then your body. But if you let the body the five senses so the things you see the things you hear the things you touch the, the the influences of the world be the lens through which things are poured then it would then influence your body would influence your soul and then your soul would influence your spirit and the result will be totally different but it does not change who you really are it just changes how you're walking so we have to be very careful with our wills and then the last one in the soul is our emotions these ones that's the favorite trigger of the enemy in Nigeria your emotions
emotions. Because if he can get you to act on your emotions in any moment, you will always, like anytime you're acting for your emotions, you're not acting for your spirit. That's the first thing you must learn. And so what we then tend to do is that we make decisions based on how something feels in this moment. And your feelings are not invalid. They are just not always true. The Bible says, for example, the Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But there will be times where you feel alone. And what do you do when you feel alone? Because your feelings are valid. But it does not mean that you are alone. So you get angered by somebody, whether it's in traffic, whether it's in how somebody speaks to you, whether it's the people that can get to your emotions the most, the people that are close to you, and they, they say something that scars you, whether it's based on something they know about your past, whether it's based on mistakes. And, and it's so easy then to be triggered by your emotions, but your emotions are not a reflection of your identity. They are the lens that often the enemy will try to use to destabilize you from ever walking in who you really are. Because if I can get you to feel like you're not good enough, if I can get you to feel like you're not loved, if I can get you to feel like these people aren't valid that are around you, then you start cutting off the things that the Lord had put to help you. You start cutting off resources and areas and it's so hard to believe who you really are. When God spoke to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's response was, how can I possibly do that? I am a youth. The Lord told him first, don't say that you're a youth. Then he goes off to show him things and who he's called him and what he's called him to be. And he says, I put my words in your mouth. And then he tells Jeremiah, go prepare yourself. It is really hard until you get to the place of preparing yourself in your soul, preparing yourself in your body to walk in who you really are in your spirit. How do you prepare yourself? There's a thing about faith that means walking and preparing yourself for that which you do not know. God spoke to Abraham. He said that I made you the father. And he said, I will go and I will take you to a land which I will show you. He did not know where he was going. Still, this man packed his bags. Have you prepared yourself even when you don't know where you're going? Even when you don't know where it is, how far it is, the direction you ought to be walking. But you ought to start if you really believe that you are who he said you are. Even if you do not feel like it today, the first thing you've got to do is prepare yourself. In 1 Peter 1 verse 3, the Lord says, prepare. He says, gird up, which is often translated for prepare. Gird up the loins of your mind. Begin to prepare in your mind for the place that I will take you. Begin to grow and go to the gym in your mind to begin to have the stature, the walk, the charisma, to be the person God has said you are, even though you don't feel like that person, look like that person, have the authority of that person yet in the physical. You haven't been given the position, you haven't been given the role, and yet you carry yourself that way. I won't use Nigeria as an example because... But if you look at elections, let's say in America, you see often what happens is someone has to run and they're running for the office of president, but they cannot, they don't just become president the day. Someone must first see you as president. You have to carry yourself like a president. And then they look at you and say, this person looks presidential. And they say, this person has the character of a president. This person has the thoughts and the mind of a president. This person has planned presidentially. And when they see you as a president, they vote you in as president and so you have to become before you enter the position of authority you don't get into the seat of authority and suddenly become the person you ought to be you prepare yourself beforehand you've got to get to a place where God has said this is where he's taking me I'm going to start preparing my mind I'm going to start preparing myself I'm going to walk in those things I'm going to learn about those things prepare yourself for where he's taking you you might not even the hardest thing often is we have an idea 
we don't fully know and so you're like where am i even preparing for where did abraham know he was preparing himself for did he know what to pack did he know what the weather would be like where he was going did he know how long the journey would be did he know how much food he would need or water he would need but he still packed And we think of this, we think of just, I get to wake up tomorrow, decide I'm moving, I'm going. I don't know about you, but I do know about you. We all got African parents up in here. So, what happens? You just decided I'm getting up and I'm moving. To where? I don't know. He had to engage in battles before he started on a journey that he did not know where he was going to. He didn't know what fruit was going to come out of it. He knew a promise. How easy is it to step out on the thing that God wants you to do when everybody around you will tell you that doesn't that makes zero sense. But still you prepare yourself. And still you say, Today I'm gonna to learn a little bit more about what it is to be in that position. Today I'm gonna to learn a little bit more about what it is to own a business. Today I'm gonna to learn a little bit more about what it is to be rich. Today I'm going to learn a little bit more about what it is to be good, what it is to be righteous, what it is to be kind, what it is to be loving, what it is to be somebody who gives, even though I don't even know what it is to have, I don't know what it is to give. But all of a sudden you start to prepare yourself in that place. And the greatest preparation that there ever has or will be is deepening our understanding and our relationship with God. There are hidden wisdoms, hidden hidden treasures, hidden understandings and revelations in the hiding place of his glory. And so when he says prepare yourself, he's just, he's including prepare yourself. If If it was an exam, prepare yourself to study. But he's saying also prepare yourself in me because there are things that I will show you you have no idea when you're going to need them. But the Bible says that he would bring it to your remembrance. That's why he said he'll give you the Holy Spirit because he will bring to your remembrance in the moment of your need. You had no idea why you took that course. It had nothing to do with the career you planned, nothing to do with the job you've got, nothing to do with where you are, but God is preparing you for a place you have no idea about. What is it that God was doing with Joseph when he started preparing him? Did he know for a moment that he was going to have to rule over rule over the entire of Egypt and God was teaching him how to train in a man called Potiphar's house. They teach him how to lead people who, who, who were detestable, people who were sinners, people who made mistakes in the place of a prison. God was preparing him in that place. He should not have been a prisoner, but he had to learn to be and to deal with people who committed sin, how to deal with people who were false, people who were disgusting in in their mindsets and their ways because when you know how to lead them you know how to lead everyone there is so much that God has for you but you've got to prepare yourself preparation doesn't start when someone tells you I'm going to give you this job in 10 days now I need you to prepare yourself for that job preparation starts long before you know the job is coming God has said this is who you are this is where I've called you to the Bible says with Joseph that from the moment that word came out of who he was God prepared him, said the word of God tested him. Every single day the promise is beating you up, beating you black and blue, and you don't know that it's shaping you. But it is. In Jesus' name. God, there are kings and priests in this place. There are titans of industry. There are leaders of nations in this room. There are people with dynamic innovations that will change a generation that their eyes cannot even see. Teach them, O Lord, 
to prepare themselves for what right now is impossible, invisible, unimaginable, uncontainable, that their minds cannot even begin to wrestle with it, but prepare them today for that which they know not. Give your people the ability, the courage, the stature to stand in who they are. I pray for beyond anything, the courage. The courage. I've heard God's voice in my life. I will be who God has said that I am. I will not be what I look like. I will not be what I've done. I will not be my mistakes. I will be who God says that I am. I will be who God says that I am. I will be who God says that I am. I will be who God says that I am. Begin now, Holy Spirit. Transform destinies. Transform lives. Carry people. Carry them on oceans. Carry them into new territories. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, begin to prepare your people. 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 what only you can do in the mighty name of Jesus Christ Amen